Well, I mentioned last Sunday that I wanted to spend some time uh, thinking about the church with you. And uh, now that we wrapped our exposition of, of John, and before jumping into another book, I thought it would be helpful for us to study the church, uh, what the Bible has to say about the church. And a good place to start with, uh, with that, in my estimation, is the 92nd Psalm. So let's go ahead and make our way to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. The superscription says, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night with the ten-stringed lute and with the harp, with resounding music upon the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. A, sen a senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this, that when the wicked sprouted up like grass, and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. And my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. <coughs> Planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap in every green tree. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in Him. Now this psalm at the uh, superscription. It says that it was a psalm. A song for the Sabbath day. Now the Sabbath as we know was the day of rest for the Old Testament saints. A day to, to set the heart and the mind on spiritual things. To celebrate God as creator. The equivalent of the Sabbath for us as New Testament believers is the Lord's day. A day in which we celebrate God as redeemer. The day in which Christ, the Son of God, rose from the grave. We celebrate that Sunday after Sunday. So if we applied this text to our context, we would then say that this is a song about church for church. And that makes it ideal actually to start off our, our study on the church because songs, this is a song, move the heart. And these days our hearts need to be moved in a special way with respect to the church. Because it doesn't come naturally. You see, we are in a society that is inherently individualistic, whereas in times past, people tended to see themselves as part of something greater than themselves. A family, community, nation, state, church. Nowadays, they actually seem to take it for granted that they are individually the measure of all things. The world actually adapts itself to you. We see uh, uh, the extreme expression of that in the transgender movement. The world has to adapt itself to the kind of gender that I believe I am. So your individual self, your self-expression is what is most important nowadays. And technology, as we know, only exacerbates that because it's created an environment in which everything you see is actually tailored to you. Your preferences, your likes, your interests, your needs. So, the modern man lives in a world in which he himself is the greatest thing that there is. The greatest thing that there is. And that makes it really difficult, again, for anybody to be a church man. 
it makes it very difficult for anybody to seek to live and die for something outside of himself, to find his identity in something greater than self, to see ourselves as simply part of a whole. But that's precisely what each of us needs to do, to see ourselves as part of a greater whole. In fact, you'll notice that this psalm actually divides all people into two groups, all humanity, into two kinds of people and two kinds of people alone. Those who are evil and do evil, and yet they, they sprout like grass, but they also wither away like grass. And then there are those who are planted in the house of the Lord, and it says that they flourish and they still yield fruit in old age. They last forever. In other words, you are either in the church and abide, or you are out of the church and you are swept away in judgment with the world. You are either part of this great institution that Jesus is building, or you are outside of it and are destroyed. And that means that we need to make all of us a conscious decision that we will be church men and church women. We need to commit ourselves to this institution that Christ is building. Our, our hearts need to be moved to set our affection and our sweat and tears into this one institution, the building of God, the house of God. And to help us with that, we're going to consider first why we should love the church. That's the first thing that I want to do. I want to I want to help you think why you should love the church. And then we want to talk about the message of the church and then about who the members of the church should be. So really, I want to answer three questions from this text. Number one, why should you love the church? Number two, what should you expect the message of the church to be? And number three, who should you expect the members of the church to be? So let's begin with that first one. Why should you love the church? Why should you love it? Look at verses 1 and 2 of our text again. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. So the writer, notice he is starting, this is again a psalm for the Sabbath day, about the Sabbath, and about church in our own context, and he is starting off by doing one thing. He is preaching to himself. He's preaching to himself. He's actually seeking to calibrate his mind and his heart for what is about to happen in worship. He's actually telling himself, this is good. Regardless of my emotions, regardless of what's going on in life, this, what I'm about to do, is good. What is good? Well, corporate gathering of God's people, public worship of God, church. Notice that he lists uh, the activities that are carried out. In corporate worship, he says, giving thanks, singing praises, declaring God's loving kindness and faithfulness. Those are the things that we do at church. We gather together as a people to give thanks to God. We do that in our prayers. We do that in the course of our preaching. And we do that in our songs. And obviously, he also talks about singing praises. Uh, Did you know that there are uh, uh, over 50 direct commandments in the Bible about singing? And there are over 400 mentions of singing itself. So music and singing, they're very prominent in the scriptures. And by the way, verse 3 here uh, sanctions the use of musical instruments. Notice verse 3. With the ten-stringed lute and with the harp, with resounding music upon the lyre. All of those, by the way, are string instruments. The word for ten-stringed lute in the Hebrew here literally is ten uh, so this was some sort of deca chord. Uh, the translators, uh, they, they put lute here because scholars believe that this looked like one, like kind of like a guitar that they would use. But apart from that, there's, a, there's mention here of l- harps and lyres. And those two terms for harp and lyre, they're, they're often interchangeable. So the text could be talking about one instrument uh, that, is, that is referred to by different names, or two different, two, two different instruments that are actually very similar, like saying uh, an alto sax and a, a baritone sax. Two instruments that are essentially the same, and these two are harps. Harp, by the way, was the national instrument of the Hebrews. 
it had been invented, if you begin reading the scriptures uh, in Genesis, it had been invented all the way back in the antediluvian days, uh, the pre-flood era by Jubal. Jubal invented uh, the liar, it says there in uh, Genesis 4. I, I do wonder if uh, Noah, as he was building his ark, would put some of these instruments so that they could then reverse engineer them uh, after they got into the new world. Um, but uh, harps are very old instruments, and they uh, used to be used for all kinds of contexts, celebratory, uh, even in, in, in serious times as when David was seeking to soothe the raging of King Saul. He would play a harp for him. But here, the commandment is to use harps and instruments like the harp in the praise of God and to accompany the singing of God's people. You know, some people say that Christians uh, are not allowed to use instruments in the worship of God. That's a difficult argument to make with verses like these. Uh, It seems to me that instruments can certainly back up our corporate singing. But I hope you're seeing here that singing and music... We don't just do them to fill up our, our, our time or because it's nice or because we have some dead space that we want to add something nice to. No, actually, this is a commandment by God for us to make music. It's one of the great functions of the church. Jonathan Edwards, the, that great preacher and philosopher who, who towers over uh, the, the 18th century as, as a great light of the church, he, he used to write these little theological notes uh, in his study. Some people say that he studied 11 hours a day. I don't know how he did it um, because he had a family. And if I try to do that, it won't go very well. But uh, he used to study all this time. And uh, he, he would have these notes that he would write to himself uh, as uh, theological ideas uh, came to him. And they are published as his miscellanies. And uh, one, one day I was flipping through those miscellanies, uh, and he, he had one on heaven. And this is what he says about heaven. Uh, speaking of heaven and music, he says, The best, most beautiful, and most perfect way that we have of expressing a sweet concord or agreement of mind to each other is by music. When I would form in my mind ideas of a society in the highest degree happy, I think of them as expressing their love, their joy, and, their, and the inward concord and harmony and spiritual beauty of their souls by sweetly singing to each other. I love that this is the kind of thing that this man was thinking about. I wonder if those are the kinds of thoughts that, that you have when you're all alone. Uh, but, but he's speaking of uh, this idea of heaven as a place where singing prevails because there's a sweet agreement among people and they are singing the same melody and the same words and are full of joy and are moved by the emotions of that. So you have singing in church. You have the giving of thanks. You have singing praises. But also David mentions here declaring the loving kindness of God in the morning and His faithfulness by night. So we are to declare or proclaim. We do that, of course, in preaching. But that's not limited to preaching itself. We can speak of proclaiming uh, we, can, we, we proclaim when we sing, we proclaim or when we have those corporate readings together, we proclaim the truth. And um, we, uh, we do, we, what do we declare here? Well, the loving kindness and the faithfulness of God. The word for loving kindness here in the Hebrew is chesed. Uh, actually, it's a quite difficult word to translate because we don't have an English equivalent of that. Sometimes it appears as, as mercy, sometimes as steadfast love or loyal love. The term basically describes covenantal faithfulness, covenantal faithfulness, to be true to your vows. It also denotes the goodness of one who is superior uh, to an, uh, uh, toward an inferior or fa- the favor of one uh, toward another who does not deserve that favor. So it's actually a perfect way, a perfect word for describing the dealings of God with His people. He shows chesed to them, loyal love, loving kindness, love, mercy, mercy, uh, grace. Now, on the other hand, David also talks about faithfulness here and uh, declaring his faithfulness at night. The word there is the same as the root that we translate as amen 
or truly. So basically, you're saying by night that God is amen, that God was true. Look at verse 2 again. In the morning, you're declaring the covenant, the covenant loyalty of God. He will be true to His promises. He will show me mercy today. He will fulfill His vows to me in Jesus Christ. And by night, you're looking back now and declaring His faithfulness. He did do what I said. He showed me His trustworthiness once again. So if you are a believer, if you are part of the church and you are engaging in the functions of the church, you're actually caught up in this constant cycle of praise, looking forward and looking forward to God's grace, looking back and seeing that God's grace came through. And that means that church, by the way, shouldn't just be something that you do whenever you feel like it. No, the assembly of the righteous is an ongoing thing, day and night, week in, week out. It is an ongoing thing. It's life. This is why Paul said to Timothy to preach in season and out of season. Church doesn't stop. We saw some churches stop recently. Uh, in, uh, in, in 2022, when... Christmas Day fell on a Sunday. There were all these churches that decided to close their, their doors. Uh, they, they, they decided to not meet on a particular Sunday. And beyond that, you have at the individual level, uh, people who easily get into the habit of not being at church. But think about, it. Uh, think about that. What does that say about a church who decides... Because of their own reasons, we don't, we're not going to have church today. Or about a, uh, an individual who decides that he just doesn't feel like going to church that day. What does that say about that person? Why do you think that you can take a break from praising your Creator and your Redeemer? What does that say about your view of worship? What is worship all about for you? Is it about you? Is it about your experience and your emotions and your entertainment and your excitement? Whatever happened to the God whom you're claiming to worship? What about His worthiness? What about His pleasure? What about what He wants? Church is for Him. Although, church is motivated by what He has done for us. Look at verse 4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. The, the particle 4 here at the beginning of the verse it gives us the reason why it's good to engage in these activities, to thank God, to sing praises and declare His loving kindness and faithfulness, to do church. Why is it good? Well, because He's made you glad by what He has done and the works of His hands, David says here. So what, what has He done? What are the works of His hands? Well, we can begin with creation. He created us. He made us. But beyond that, uh, he, he also preserves us. And all that we have comes from Him and he is also ruling the world. He's unfolding all of history. Not a hair from your head falls without his permission. So everything is taking place because God is causing it to take place. And not only that, but if you are in Christ, he saved you. Those are the greatest works of his hands, his own redemption. He sent his own dear son to die at the cross for you at Golgotha. He raised him up on the third day so that you might yourself have an inheritance with Him and be uh, counted or adopted as a child of God. And then He sent His Spirit into the world to guide you and gave you His own Holy Spirit to comfort you and to make you fruitful even in this dark and evil world. So God truly, truly, truly has made us glad. He's put a song in our hearts, as David says. This is why, again, he says, this is good. It is good to praise and to sing and to preach. It is good to show up for public worship. Again, he's going into church and he is thinking about the goodness of it. It is good ultimately in that it brings glory to God. It is good ethically in that God created, uh, God created us and it's only right that we should worship Him. It is good relatively in that it is better than any other leisurely activity that you might engage in on a Sunday morning. Uh, the king of Israel, think about it. David himself was the king of Israel. He could have been doing any 
anything else on a Sunday morning. He was a man as a king who had everything. He could enjoy any pleasure that this life could give. He could have gone hunting. He could have been feasting. He could have been sightseeing. You name it, it was at his fingertips. And yet, in Psalm 63, and verses 2 to 3, he talks about having gone to the sanctuary of God to see the power and the glory of God. And then immediately, what is his cry? He says, your loving kindness is better than life. He came to public worship and came out saying, this is better than life. This is preferable to the golf course. This is preferable to the beach. This is preferable to the mountains or any other leisurely activities, any other pleasure that life might be able to give me. To see God and to get a glimpse of Him, it's better because He is better than life. And of course, church is better than sinful activities that you might go do on any given day. That's why Psalm in uh, Psalm 84.10 says, I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I would rather be worshiping than engaging in the pleasures of sin. So the church, again, is good ultimately. It is good ethically. It is good relatively. And it is good also practically. Uh, church, we learn how to love God and neighbor and to live well, to have wisdom. Husbands, they see the example of Jesus Christ and they learn to lead and love their wives sacrificially. Women learn to be submissive and to be marked by gentle and quiet spirits. Children are taught to obey their parents if they will do well in life. Grandparents are encouraged to proclaim the goodness and the grace of God to their children's ch children. I could go on and on and on. Church is practically good. We understand that. But it is also emotionally good. It is emotionally good. In Psalm 73, you have the story of Asaph, who is uh, depressed, really, in a, in a very real kind of depre de de depression. He's bothered by the fact that he sees so many evil people doing well for themselves in the world, while saints like him just seem to be suffering all the time, and things seem to be so difficult for, for him, and and he is depressed over that. But he says that that depression actually ended when he came to the sanctuary of God. And he realizes, it says that he perceived their end, the end of the wicked. He realized that the prosperity that they had, the good life that they were enjoying, was only an illusion. It was only an illusion. It was going to end quickly and destruction was going to be what they would have for the rest of eternity. They will die, and yet the godly will live forever. And when Asaph understood that, he was revived. He regained his joy. So church is good emotionally. You know, church has become, of course, less and less prevalent in this society. And, and I don't know if you've noticed, but as church has receded into the background, so has depression and grief skyrocketed. People don't go to church anymore and they are so miserable. And the treatment that this culture provides for that makes matters even worse. This is a, this is a culture of atheistic secularism. And if that's the religion of our culture, then there are priests. And the priests are the psychiatrists who mix up all these drugs for the people who need spiritual help. They're like our witch doctors. And the, their concoctions actually make matters worse. We know that. People on drugs for depression and all these other so-called psychological disorders, they end up worse off because of the medication they're given. You would think that with the rise of psychology and psychiatry and all these so-called science, that society would be improved, but, but it's actually filled with insane people, more and more. But again, you walk in here on a Sunday morning, and what do you sense? Joy and peace and love. You, you encounter happy people. 
That means church is good. Church is good emotionally. It's good ultimately. It's good ethically, relatively, practically, emotionally. This is why you should love church. God loves the church. Shouldn't you want to love the same thing that God loves? So that's at least one answer to why we should love the church. The question of uh, why we ought to love the church, we've answered that. But I want to ask, uh, ask another question this morning. We're obviously not going to get through the whole psalm. Uh, but I want to ask this second question. What should you expect the message of the church to be? The church is a community with a message. We all, we all inherently understand it, that the church is a teaching community. In fact, this is why you, you hear people, even if they've never been to church or are no, not familiar with religion at all, they ask questions like, what does your church teach about such and such? What does the Roman Catholic Church have to say about such and such a thing? Uh, so, so the church is a community with a message, inherently. And uh, we need to know what that message is and what Scripture would have us say. Uh, it's important to know that, and it's important for that message to be biblical, because the Bible actually says that there are some so-called churches that are not, not churches at all. In the words of the London Baptist Confession of Faith, some have degenerated so much, quote, that they have ceased to be churches of Christ and have become synagogues of Satan, end quote. You see a, a rainbow flag flying outside of the church? Synagogue of Satan. That's kind of the easy one to answer. We need to get deeper than that. Uh, we need to understand what the message of the true church is if we'll judge whether a particular church is true or false. Now, David presents that message in a nutshell here, uh, he gives us the important doctrines that we need to keep in mind. First of all, the preaching of the church has to have a high view of God. A high view of God, or what I'm going to call here a transcendent theology. A transcendent theology. Look at verse 5. How great are your works, your thoughts are very deep. Now notice, uh, he, he started off the psalm by, by calibrating his mind, by telling himself that it is good to be at church. And then verse 4, he, he finishes that first stanza by, by pledging to sing to God for joy. And then in verse 5, he's opening now the actual song that he wants to sing. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. So this song that he's singing, notice it, it is about the greatness of God, or, or the greatness of God's works and the incomprehensibility of the works of God, which means that God Himself cannot be comprehended in His greatness. So He uses the expressions here, how great and very deep. The, the word for great here is gadol in the Hebrew. You can translate that as magnificent or mighty. And the, and the word how, how great, is, is moving the, the sentence from being a, a, a mere proposition to be in an exclamation. You're not just saying God is great. You're saying how great. How great are your works. The things that God is able to do are infinitely above our comprehension. And I wonder if in our preaching and in our gathering we, we understand that and we get that across. For example, we think of, man's, of man as great when he invents a microphone to amplify the voice. That's great. I'm glad. But think of the greatness of God compared to that. He actually invented the vocal cords and the throat and the tongue and the, and the teeth and the lips. We think of men as great when they built skyscrapers over a period of five or ten years. But God actually made the whole cosmos in six days and that by speaking. We think of men as great when they, when they strategize brilliantly in, in war and military strategies. But God actually planned the great salvation in Christ in so amazingly that we are told that even the, the angels, they, they long to look. They get neck cramps trying to peer into the great salvation of Christ to understand it. God's works are so, so great. And of course, that's only because He Himself is great. 
And then the psalmist says, hey, look, your thoughts are very deep. Now, the word for thoughts here, that can denote the, the, uh, the idea of invention. It was, it was used of um, the works of Uzziah's engineers when they invented these powerful war machines that, that made Israel the highest military power during that day. Now, we know that God doesn't actually invent anything in the sense that he figures anything out. God's never learned anything because he has declared the end from the beginning. He doesn't have to figure anything out. Nothing catches him by surprise. Nevertheless, we can say from our perspective, humanly speaking, we can say that God is strategizing, that, that he is responding to things when this happens, look how God answered. Look what God di did. And, and he's saying these inventions, these, these executions of that inter eternal decree, the, the way that, that, that providence has its twists and turns, those are very deep, very, very, very deep. Of course, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the incarnation of the Son of God. How from the Old Testament, the people of God could see all of these prophecies and not understand how all of them could come together in the one person. How was he going to be from Bethlehem? And how was he going to be called a Nazarene? And how uh, was he uh, going to fulfill the rest of the promises? The tribe of Judah, a Galilean. How was that going to happen? Well, amazingly, his parents had moved to Galilee, so he grows up a Galilean. But he was from the tribe of Judah. Uh, and uh, he, of course, is, grows up in an area where he is despised, and so he's a Nazarene. Again, the works of God are amazing. The twists of providence are great. In the days of, of Esther, you have Naaman seeking to, or Haman actually seeking to kill the Jewish people, and providence twists so that actually the Jewish people end up exalted above all the other peoples in the empire. The works of God are astounding. The cross is very deep. The incarnation, very deep. All the other stories in the scriptures are deep and amazing. The word for deep actually here is mystery. It means a mystery. And he intensifies that by adding very. So he is saying again that these things are incomprehensible to us. We can't even grasp our, or, or wrap our minds around them. And if they are, the works of God are incomprehensible, then how much more God Himself? How much more God Himself? He is not a man that, that we should understand uh, exactly or, or, or comprehend all that He is. We know Him. We have an apprehension of His glory, but not a comprehension. He is not a bigger and better version of us. No, He is holy. He is holy. He is uh, other. He is majestically holy. And that means that as much as we rejoice in coming to Him in worship, we also do that in trembling or with trembling. That we approach this God, we understand to be so great, we approach Him reverently with fear and with awe. Our worship as a church is to be solemn, solemn. There are so many churches that actually can't endure that. They, they want to have flippant type of worship. They, they want church to just seem very lighthearted and flippant the whole time. They, they, want, they want church to be a party. But actually, you know what? The first time the church was a party, it was Israel in the wilderness and they were worshiping a golden calf. Flippant worship is what you offer a false deity. True worship is what you engage in when you know the true God and you understand who He is and therefore you have a high view of God. You have a transcendent theology. But apart from that, the message of the church is characterized by a low view of man. So if you have a high view of God, you also have a low view of man, or what I'm going to call here a lapsarian anthropology. Now, those are two big words, but lapsarian, by that I mean of the fall, and anthropology, the study of man. So we view man as fallen. We have a lapsarian anthropology. 
And, and David has one here. Verse 6. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this. Pause. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew word for senseless man here has the same root as beast. Beast. So this is a, a brutish person whose reasoning capacity is inoperable. And then you have the word stupid here, which means essentially the same thing. Sometimes uh, that term is translated as fool. And, and, and that's because... Uh, Solomon himself says that, that, the, that the fool, he has no delight in understanding. Now, uh, we're not talking so much here about being unable to reason concerning natural things, but rather we are speaking of the capacity to reason in a spiritual way. Notice, by the way, that he, he says that the, the stupid man doesn't understand this. And what is this? Well, he goes on to provide the essence of all spiritual thought. Evil will lose. God is exalted. God will be exalted. God will sell, save his own. It's all spiritual thought in a nutshell. But some can't grasp that. Or they can actually grasp it in their minds. They can repeat the words. But they don't grasp it in a spiritual sense. It doesn't burn a hole through their heart. They don't, they don't receive it sincerely for themselves. They don't receive it as reality. And who are they? Well, we know the answer to this question. All natural men, everybody who is born in Adam is this way. This is uh, the fall into sin. We are born incapable of reasoning spiritually. We are stupid, foolish, senseless. The... Natural man is that. The, 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 the Bible calls the unbeliever blind, deaf, wretched. Sometimes even dogs and swine and snakes. And the world, of course, hates that. The world can't stand that kind of language because the world has an, a, a, an inflated view of human prowess. A perfect illustration of that is when you walk into the Sistine Chapel, you find there Michelangelo's uh, The Creation of Adam. And there you see that God and Adam are actually at the same level. And they're both men. And they're touching each other's finger. And uh, that is uh, sort of the, the world's understanding of what man is. God is just like him and they are at the same level. And yet that's directly the opposite of what the Bible says. That the Bible has a very low view of man. You say yes and it's offensive. Well, yes. The Bible has a low view of sinners. Every part of the unbeliever is depraved. He can't make himself take hold of God. He has fallen. He's a, a, a stench to the nostrils of a holy God. He can't do anything for himself. You're, you say, you're preaching Calvinism. Well, yes, I hope that we all become Calvinists. But not because it's a label, but because it's the Bible. And any church actually that's not willing to preach about the wretchedness of man and the inability of man to do anything to save himself, any church that is not able and willing to preach that way is actually just slow clapping people into the slaughterhouse. As they hurl headlong into destruction, you're slow clapping because you won't tell them the truth because for you to, get the, for you to make the cure, something that the sinner needs, you've got to provide the right diagnosis. How can I make you undergo chemotherapy if I'm telling you that you just have a flu? You've got to know that you have cancer and you're dying. So give your life to Christ. It'll cost you everything, but your condition is very desperate. You only will understand that if you see your own depravity. Why do I need to to, to, why do I need to have Christ if I'm already a decent person? Why does God have to save me if, if I'm so capable? We, we actually say, no, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You actually can't do anything for yourself. You're offensive to God. God is angry. And your salvation actually depends entirely upon His mercy. Entirely upon His mercy. You, you can go ahead and plead that He would save you. Ask Him, beg Him for grace. That He would show you grace. He doesn't actually have to do it because He's God. He doesn't have to save you. But He is by nature a saving and a gracious God. 
So ask him. So we have a Lapsarian anthropology and a transcendent theology. Here's another thing that we ought to have in our message, how our message ought to be. We have to have a triumphant eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the last things. And it has to be triumphant. What happens in the end? Well, notice what David says, verse 7. The, the stupid man doesn't understand this, that when the wicked sprouted up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. Notice, uh, so in this part, David, David decides to bring up, uh, we've, we've alluded to this before, one of the constant anxieties of the godly. And, and, and that, this is uh, the thought that has repeatedly plagued the righteous. And that is the thought that evil people always seem to be doing well. They bloom like grass, they flourish, and it doesn't happen rarely. It seems to always be happening. Notice David says that all who do iniquity flourish. This is, of course, hyperbole, but he's making the point that it's so common that there doesn't even seem to be any exceptions to the rule. Bad people always do well. The celebrities, the rich, the powerful, overwhelmingly wicked. And God's people, on the other hand, are a handful of nobodies and afflicted people. Paul said himself, not many wise, not many noble, but the foolish of the world. But David says here, look, the wicked only flourish so that they might be destroyed forevermore and scattered. This is the, the message that he receives as he is worshiping, as he is appearing in the, God, in the corporate assembly of God's people, that the wicked only flourish so that they might be destroyed forevermore. The, the word destroy here is mostly used in the Hebrew for sudden catastrophes, like warfare and mass killings. Or else, sometimes it is actually used for slow and pay, painful deaths, like death by famine or by oppression of an, of an enemy, like torture of an enemy combatant. And, and sometimes the verb itself, destroy, can be translated as annihilated. Annihilated and uh, utter destruction. But, he, I love this, he's careful to, to uh, say that this is not a bringing to non-existence, lest we think that. This is why he adds the expression forevermore. Their destruction is not just annihilation, it's not just a once and for all, and you, you don't exist anymore. But he says that it is a destruction forever. It is a destruction that has no end. People do not stop burning in hell, ever, ever. There are men, women, who were put there thousands of years ago. They're still there. They're still there. And that punishment, we know, is really severe, severe punishment. David alludes to that by the emphasis he adds to the idea of God's enemies perishing in Hebrew poet, poetry. If you want to emphasize something, you repeat it. And so it says, Behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies will what? Perish. They will be destroyed severely. <coughs> David, uh, in another place in Psalm 11, talks about the portion of the wicked, this, this same destruction that he's talking about here, as uh, fire and brimstone and burning wind. And Jesus himself described it as the fiery oven, and the lake of fire in Revelation. And in our text, David speaks of the punishment of hell, even as scattering. He uses the, the expression scattering or separating. Separating what? Well, sinners from each other. Because oftentimes, sinners will pick up encouragement from others who are standing with them. But in hell, the soul is alone with God, with the consuming fire. It'll just be you and Him. No one else. And the loneliness, the loneliness, scattering all by yourself. The, actually, the, the, the idea of a scattering used to be one of the worst judgments that God could bring to the people of Israel. You would scatter across the nations. Each of you will be uh, in, a, in a foreign nation with a foreign language and uh, away from your kinsmen. And that was a, a, a torture to them. But here you have... This lonely, this, this lonely hell, this lonely suffering, outer darkness. And it's spoken of here as a sudden judgment against the flourishing wicked. 
They're, they're, they're blooming one day, just like the grass, and in an instant, they are withered and gone. That grass that has been dying outside died from one day to the next. You did not even notice. All of a sudden, you came out, and it's yellow. What happened? What happened? It was so green very recently. What happened? This is uh, the judgment of God that it comes suddenly. Jesus himself spoke of his coming and, and uh, compared it to the days of Noah when people were performing all the normal functions of life, eating, drinking, getting married, uh, uh, enjoying themselves and making plans for the future. And suddenly all this flood came and they all died. He's also compared his coming to the destruction of Sodom. And here you had these uh, homosexuals who were living for their own perverse pleasures and in an instant God comes and blows up the whole place and kills them all. The judgment of God is sudden. You're living your life with a measure of health. You're, you got plans for the future. You got some money saved up. And all of a sudden, stroke. All of a sudden, heart attack. All of a sudden, you stepped where you shouldn't have stepped and you fell and something hit your head and you're dead. Car accident. And all of a sudden, you open your eyes and you're in judgment. You got chains around your hands. Or else, the Lord Jesus comes back. You're going about your daily life, and the skies split open, and there is the Son of Man with great glory. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, that He would come as a thief in the night. And by the way, this is why I'm not a post-millennial. Uh, because post-millennials actually teach that, that Jesus is not going to come back until the church first takes over the whole world. And if the church has to take over the whole world for Jesus to come, well, He certainly isn't coming tonight. <laughs> Maybe we'll do better some other day, but He wouldn't come tonight. And I reject that because we have to have this eschatology of imminence that Jesus can actually show up tonight. And what is arguably more important than um, that imminence is that your, your, your eschatology has to has to consistently express that the rise and the fall of the wicked actually happened purposefully for God's glory. They flourished actually so that God would be glorified. The psalmist says that the wicked flourished so that they might be destroyed. But God is on high forever. In other words, God raises them up just like He did Pharaoh and He shows His glory even in their destruction. That's in Romans 9, 22 and 23. He shows His patience in enduring their blasphemies. He shows His goodness in feeding them and nourishing them, even if they are actually their, His enemies and hate Him. He shows His justice in repaying them exactly as they deserve. He shows His power in crushing them when He does decide to arise. But the other effect that this all has, this uh, bringing up of wicked people and destroying them. The other effect that that has is that in doing that, God actually shows His elect how much He loves them, with what kind of love He loves them. Notice actually verse 10. David says, But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. This is grace upon grace. And my eyes has looked exultantly upon my enemies. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. Uh, the, word, the word in Hebrew here for wild ox, um, scholars believe, refers to, to a kind of massive buffalo that's now extinct. Sometimes you'll find it as unicorn. But uh, that animal would have been a monoceros with one horn. And, and the horn uh, back then, uh, since it was the chief means, still, still is for horned animals, the chief means of attack and defense with, uh, uh, with them, those uh, horns were taken as emblems of power and dominion and fierceness. And, and, and so he is appealing to the wild ox, the, the most powerful of all horned creatures, the most mighty of them. And he is saying, you have exalted me like the horn of the wild ox. In other words, you have exalted me above all exaltation. David is saying that God has elevated him, has elevated him, has raised him up on like 
others. And, and he adds also that, that God has anointed him with fresh oil. Now, that, that's what was used to refresh someone. If they came to your house after a long trip, you would give them, uh, you would give them oil to refresh them. Um, and, and so God is going to exalt and refresh David. That is what he's looking forward to. He's saying, you've done it in the past, you will do it again in the future. And that's the end of time for me, exaltation, refreshment. And that, again, over the wicked, because he says that his eyes would see the destruction of his enemies, so his enemies would be destroyed, and he would be looking at his enemies, he would be hear, hearing of the destruction of those enemies, and as that was happening, he himself would be exalted. That's his hope. He's looking forward to that. In the coming destruction of the wicked, he saw, actually, that God was going to show him how greatly he loved him, how amazing his grace toward him was, Think about it. When it's all said and done, the rise and the fall of the wicked is actually going to put, again, the display of God's love for the elect. Because we did what they did. They sinned, we sinned, and yet God spared us. There are some people, think about this, there are some people suffering eternally in hell right now for less sins that you and I already have committed. Yet we receive mercy. We receive mercy. This grace is undeserved. It's because God wants to. That's the answer to the question of why. Why me? Because I want to. Not because you did anything. You actually did the same thing as the man who is in hell right now. You did more than some who are in hell right now. But I saved you because I wanted to. So all things, again, go back to the glory of God. Not our own, not what we did, not what we deserve, but the glory of God in choosing. God makes everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of destruction, says Proverbs 16, 14. The church has to have this kind of eschatology. We have to all be able to say consistently that the wicked will be destroyed and that they will be destroyed because in that God is seeking to exalt Himself and we also say that God's people will be highly exalted, especially against that backdrop of the utter destruction of the wicked. We will shine because of God's greatness, and God's greatness will be made evident. So sometimes uh, uh, someone, someone said that you can summarize all of this history, this kind of worldview, this kind of looking at, this kind of way of looking at life uh, from the standpoints of the works of Christ in this way. What is life all about? What, if history, what is history all, of, all about? Kill the dragon, get the girl. And we can add to that and rejoice forever. And again, that requires a worldview that is, is centered not, not around this life. You can't say kill the dragon, get the girl about this life, because if we're applying it to Jesus Christ, then right now the girl is suffering. And so we have to center our life around what comes next. And some churches, again, are all about this life. For them, Christianity is all about what you get in the here and now, your purpose, your right politics, your health, your prosperity. But again, the true people of God, they look far beyond this life and, and they see a triumph that is infinitely higher than anything that, that time can provide. The true church then, again, has a transcendent theology, a lapsarian anthropology, and a triumphant eschatology. And, and that's the church that you ought to love. That's the church that you ought to be wanting to be a part of and to give your life for so, so far we've answered two questions about the church. Why should we love it? It's good. What should its message be? Just went over that. And next week we're going to talk, talk about the, the members of the church. Who are those who make up the church? Who should be those who make up the local church? But let's talk for a second about the Lord of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ. He rescued her. He is the one who has exalted His people by His grace. 
From heaven he came and sought her to be his only bride, and with his blood he bought her, and for her life he died. He shed his blood on Calvary that we might live. He shed his blood on Calvary so that we might come to know this transcendent God. He died and rose again so that we ourselves might be part of this church, this glorious institution. And we thank Him for that. And we remember that in a special way this morning by coming to His table. I'm going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Before we begin that, I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, we want to turn our eyes now to Calvary. Will you sacrifice yourself for your bride? And we gather to proclaim that. We gather to remember that. We gather to commune with you, to be instructed through the elements that you are one with us. That as we take that bread and the cup, and those elements are digested by our stomachs, as those elements come into us in the same way you yourself are one with us. We are in you. We are one with you. We thank you for the cross. We pray that you would be honored even as we remember the cross. Amen.